I got relayed back that they were told we're not in fire season. And my comment was whoever thinks we're not in fire season needs to be in the unemployment line. Yeah. I don't know who thought that, but that's where they need to be. Yeah, that's a, <laughs> that'd be, be nice to know who that was. It would be very nice to know. We, we already got one guy going to the border. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I've heard a statement, and, you know, Panhandle, Texas Panhandle, we're two, week, two weeks away from fire season no matter how much rain we get at yeah. all times. Yeah. Speaking of air sports, so fill up like so. So take me back to uh, Tuesday morning. It was in your county. The head of it was in your county. Would air sport have done any good? Yes, sir. I believe it would have. I believe there was a uh, from daylight till probably ten, ten thirty. The three-hour window there that we could have made some drops. And I'm not saying it would have helped or not, but it. I mean, it would have had to help, but. Don't know if the outcome would have been any different, but we yeah. definitely could have utilized them early Tuesday morning for a window before the wind got up. Maybe, maybe kept it north of the river. Yes, sir. Which would kept it north of Canadian. Yes, sir. It would have. Yeah, we could have at least tried to steer it. Yeah. And that's all maybes and ifs yeah. and buts, yeah. but yeah. we don't know because it didn't happen. Yeah, but. It's like, it's like, I don't know that we're going to make any changes here today, but hell, if you don't try. Yes, sir. It damn sure, it damn sure ain't going to happen, is it? Nope. So, Robert, what do you think about, what what would you, I mean, you, you were south of us, and you came in later, or you were in pretty early, I guess, but what would you, what did you take away from it that could be done different? Yeah, we've been we've been down this road, of course, Jason, many times before. I've uh, been the fire chief at Wheeler now for 25 years. Uh, we've chased this from 06, the whole deal's through. Um, you know, we had so much fire stretched out then. Resources were just, you know, you, you never like to think that the head fire is just out running and we're just continuing to let it go. But we had so many structures that were threatened. I mean, that's all we was doing was structure protection. Whenever we came in from the south and then Scott had called and said, hey, I need you in town because the wind had hit out of the north and it was pushing it. Uh, we was there when it come across the south side of Canadian. And like I say, it, it got nasty. And so all we was doing was structure protection. And then it, like I say, wildfire was just out running. Uh, from those moments and, and the time that we actually had to pull back because after the wind hit, we were, I had trucks in town, downtown Canadian, and then uh, had some on the south side that we'd left with homes. Um, those guys had started relaying back to us that the fire had already crossed Highway 60 and was headed south. And so that's when I radioed to uh, Scott and said, hey, uh, we're gonna have to go south and try to keep it out of Wheeler County and off our other communities, Briscoe, Obedi Allison, so we were treated back. Hey, didn't leave him, but uh, you know, going back to to how things played out from there, because you know, after Wednesday, we we things settled down. Uh, we kind of put stuff. Um, we had a lot of trucks back in the barn, and so most of the containment was done. What bothers me is seeing all of our uh, dollars that I think was wasted. Uh, on resources, guys, I'm telling you, the, the Tipsmith guys, they can provide some assistance in, in particular places. We know they're not going to be where we're at. But they drug this out. The containment, the deception to the public of the state of Texas in the reporting is unbelievable that this is 3% contained, this is 7% contained, which is way far from the truth. Uh, I actually took a screenshot showing the active fire on March the 8th, which still showed active fire line in Wheeler County. I sent that to my county judge and I said, uh, Judge, don't worry. Uh, they're still reporting active fire line in Wheeler County and it's been seven plus days since there was any active fire in Wheeler County. And so our reporting mechanism is broken on how we're reporting containment uh, because these fires, and then we continued to keep uh, a bunch of Tethmus crews up here. And I, 
I don't know how they get paid. I don't know how that is structured. But I do know those guys are getting paid, and we continue to keep them up here through the 16th. Uh, and a lot of times, I know those guys have got a lot of downtime, but we're paying overtime. Man, if you could funnel those dollars back to these VFDs, we're talking communication, we're talking truck upgrades. Uh, like I say, we could do a lot of good with those dollars that were, to me, uh, thrown away. Yeah, but you don't have the card, do you? No, I do not have. I'm, I'm a state certified firefighter. I got my instructors. I can train outside my department. Uh, like I said, I've been doing this for 41 years. Yeah, you come and train us in 1992 when I started the Hoover Fire Department. Yes, sir. And so you you got it figured out. This isn't your first rodeo. No. And that that's another thing that kind of burns me, too. You know, you... Maybe you don't have the badge. Maybe you don't have the the card. But I guarantee y'all bake more dang smoke than anybody. I mean, you broke your own record. We got some big fires here. And it's not because we got some big country. No doubt. And it moves way different here than it does in the trees. Yeah. Uh, you can't use the same tactics in our ground cover fires that you do in Longview don't work. Yeah, you're not going to cut. You're not going to cut through the sand hills in a brush, in a brush truck. No. You know some of the things y'all talked about earlier, being able to get access to more of these military trucks because we all know uh, I've got I've got five of them, and going through the federal surplus program, I buy those and they're. They're a bargain. I get those for $7,500, and then we build them in-house. I've got welders. I've got mechanics. We've swapped motors out in our own trucks. My guy's going to get paid for that. Uh, and so we can, we can maintain a pretty good fleet, uh, you know, just in-house. Uh, but it's, it's those trucks that are such a big asset, and, and we've gotten some good pieces of equipment for cheap. $7,500 for a five ton, which is awesome. More of those programs out there would be, because right now the, those trucks are not readily available. Everything you look on their website, they're nearly junk or parting out. So, you know, getting access to more military equipment would greatly benefit a lot of the volunteer departments. So I'm kind of hearing you're kind of giving up on the Forest Service and just going out on your own and buying them? You know, uh, many years ago we created the Sweetwater Creek Firefighter Association, so we've got a multi-county, multi-state organization. The Forest Service was coming down. Ashley Johnson was a big lot of getting that started. I know Ashley's moved up. She's still there. She's one of the longer service personnel. I've had some lengthy discussions with the Texas Forest Service, and I told them, I said, I want your airplane and I want you mopping up. I don't want you here to tell me how to run my fire. We can do that. Uh, what I would like for you to do is give me some look from the air, because that's hugely beneficial. Some airdrops on protecting some structures from time to time would be a great thing, uh, but I don't want them there telling me I don't need to be fighting that fire. It's dangerous. We train. I know that. Did, did you get held off of the fire? We did, actually in Hemp Hill County this time. I had four units up assisting Scott on the Hobart Ranch fire. And my guy told me he said it wasn't burning 10 acres and they wouldn't let us go put it out. More people, more people going to the border. And so uh, I think that was waiting on the air support, but then it grew to a much larger fire. My guy said it was plenty, plenty fightable. They could have went and put it out, been done with it in 30 minutes, and then they waited 45, and then it was a big fire. Yeah, when, when they ran me off, it was a five-acre five fire when they ran me off. And you, you, your, your guys were sitting there? I had and Scott four trucks there. Were, you, you had, what, four or five trucks there? I had four trucks there. I think Scott had three or four, too, didn't you, Scott? And I don't know how many uh, other I mean, ones. I think Briscoe, Allison was probably there as well. Isn't that right, Scott? Yes, sir. <clears throat> And they, they, they held y'all off too? Yeah, my assistant chief, I was actually in Amarillo, he called me and 
uh, he said, what do I do? I said, well, where are they at? And they said, well, they were inbound. Well, to me, inbound is they're there, they're fixing to come in and drop. He said, Scott, we could have stopped that and been home right now if they hadn't pulled us off because all it was doing was running up to a road. It crossed the road, and then it got into the trees, and then they, they, they couldn't get in there and do anything with it then. Yeah. You know, and so, and I told him, I said, well, I'd either get back after it or if you know they're coming for sure. I don't, I don't know, Robert, how finally, when did they finally show up? I'm not too sure how long after that. Maybe like I said, I was not on scene. Uh, we, we, <clears throat> well, Emmett and I were on another fire. We, we, we saw them come in. It's 45 <clears throat> minutes. And then it looked like they just dropped on the house because at that point they were no longer fighting the fire. They were saving the structure. Yes, sir. Uh, well, but, yeah, it was, it's like I say, they, they pulled them off. And, you know, I told Gary, I said, from now on, until they're buzzing, you, or you, you know, if I'm not there, you're taking, you're on charge. You need to be watching the sky for them. Once you see them, then pull out. Or when right. They used to communicate. Right. They knew, to, you know, I've talked to air attack from the ground. They used to know that they, they, they had, they knew what we operated on. Or I could hear them, and I, or I'd have y'all get in touch with them. Yep. And then we'd get and communicate, and we'd take care of things. Well, at some point in time, I'm not sure if this is the same guy that called Emmett, but he called me wanting to know who those guys were in that helicopter. <laughs> and I said, well, they're our local guys that they do this with their own money their own resources and they help us out a lot and he said well i need to get in touch with them and i said well all you got to do is get on our local channel which i believe is 122.9 yep and i said you can talk to them i said they worked with air attack before this shouldn't be it. well they're just kind of in the way we need them to get out of there because we got planes and i said well i've already gotten a phone call about your inbound planes yeah <laughs> and i told him i said y'all should have never pulled us off and later on, we figured out it the poor guy that got the brunt of Gary, my assistant, <laughs> it wasn't his decision. Somebody else sent a box somewhere, redirected them. We're not sure if they sent them over to Miami, mm -hmm. but they were doing back burning, so they should have never been sent to Miami, and they should have kept coming, and that was fine. But, you know, but when they pulled us off as early as they did, we could have had that thing out. And it was... I don't know if, what happened, but I, we, we, I did find out they did get redirected. Yeah, yeah, so. we, yeah, it was. It goes back to communication again, too. But now, mm -hmm. of course, we had communication. I was talking to them. Yes, sir. Um, I mean, you know, and I went over and hooked up with Philip. We moved a bunch of cows out of the way, saved a bunch of cows there, which was good. Mm -hmm. And then we were fighting fire, then everybody disappears, and me and Emmett, it's like, where, where'd everybody go? Well, now we fly over to the other side of the fire where they're doing a back burn on a back burn. Mm -hmm. And uh, my ranch was the neighbor over, and my ranch was on fire. Yes, sir. And Philip's like, do we need to go put your ranch, your ranch out? I'm like, no, let it burn. I don't, want, I don't want those guys over there. So just let it burn. And that's what we did. All right, I'll pass it on. Members, questions? One? All right. Have you got something? One or two or something. Go ahead. Appreciate what y'all do. You guys are obviously the front lines, and you're, you know, doing more with less than probably anybody I've heard about. So thank you. What I'm trying to wrap my head around is y'all's immediate needs so that if this situation you know comes up again you know what what is it that you know you guys need in your departments you know immediately we've talked about radios is there other things that are needed one of the things i want to touch on is the grant system and i think it got brought up earlier but these trucks they give you a twenty thousand dollar skid unit put one of these military trucks in service uh, comes along with it guys four years ago I could send that truck to steel fire apparatus in Haskell Texas and for, right at $30,000 
I'd have a painted, outfitted truck ready to go to work. All it lacked was us putting a radio in it and our stickers on it. Uh, this year, we turned around to send one down there that we got on a grant, and that same exact truck, same build exactly, was $98,000. At some point, these grants are gonna have to match the inflation. I'm fortunate enough that we do have in-house guys that can do all the work that needs to be done. And it's hard. It's hard to ask these guys to go spend the nights away from their family and everything else. But guess what? They did it without complaining, and we got the truck built. But that's one thing that needs to be the funding on the grants has to be fixed. Of course, communications, all of that. Do you currently have the trucks you need? Or is it a situation where you need some immediately or you just anticipate needing some here soon? We we need trucks. I mean, you can get down to our one tons, our newest one ton. We did hit a grant, I take that back, in 17. Uh, here we go again. I'm going to give you another issue. We went with a gas motor. Why did we go with a gas motor? EPA regulations on the diesels. They're going to kill somebody on a fire line because when they go to region, the deaf systems, not only are they starting their own fires, uh, we get county maintainers that sh stop and have to go in region. We've had them burned over and county op maintainer operators almost killed. Uh, our effective tools get pulled out because of EPA regulations. Uh, so we still have older trucks besides that 17 that are diesel, but they're 06. 2006 was a long time ago. It doesn't seem that long ago, but those trucks are getting to an age shelf life sitting there. But we do turn to the military trucks because guess what? There's not EPA regulations. So the biggest thing that we can do as a state for you guys, what I'm hearing, mm -hmm. is get some more money available in that grant program mm -hmm. and make sure we continue to fund it so that you can access it when you need it. I mean, if, there, if there's an ask today from the state, Mm -hmm. It's really getting that grant program with more money in it and more accessible for when y'all need it. Is that fair? I agree. Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. Thank you. Go ahead. I'll, I'll ask mine last. All right. All right. So speaking of your guys taking time off and um, working on trucks, Trent, did I hear a rumor that a couple of your guys got fired after being gone from fighting fire? Yes, sir. And I know there's a, another neighboring department that he had one, his guys that did get let go, and I think the employer figured out that maybe that was a bad idea and called him back. Uh, but that is something we need to talk about. I mean, I'm not asking these guys to go on every bar ditch fire, not everything. This is an exception to the rule. I mean, fire's breathing right down the town's neck. Uh, we didn't have the reinforcements from the counties around us because everybody was in the fight of their life. Hell was knocking on their doors that day. And it was just who was there. And, you know, I can't, I'm an employer as well, and I couldn't knock a guy for taking off for that, no matter what was going on. Uh, one thing I do want to leave y'all with, and it's something I've never had to do in 24 years, but I had to look people in the face these ranchers and tell them and say, folks, look, sorry, but I've got to go back to town. We've got to go protect town. And you're on your own. If I was you, I'd come with me. But I understand if you stay and fight. And I mean, to watch people's livelihood just burn up, I mean, it's pretty heartbreaking. It really is. That's one thing that's kept me awake at night. I bet. Never had to do that before, but when it hit, there was eight of my trucks standing at the north end of Pampa, Texas. And that was it. Yeah. Uh, let's, well, I got one more. So I want, I want to go back to the, um, so the brush trucks with the, with all the, the deaf crap and all the EPA government, I mean, essentially you can't use them anymore. They're, they're just a, they're a death trap now. Those trucks are made to go down the highway and Pip can help me a little bit on this, but they're made to go down the highway at highway speeds. They're not made to idle a fire line 20 mile an hour for 14, 18 hours a day. 
they'll start going down. I've personally had one go down in front of a head fire before with me in it. Pretty scary situation. Yep, shut down. Yep, just shut down, motor kills off, and I was luckily it restarted, and I had some other trucks behind me, and we got out of there. Uh, <clears throat> in Wheeler County, y'all had one, a greater. Yes, uh, of course, we've had a couple of blades burn over, and, and that's something, guys, we couldn't do what we do without our county maintainers. We had 10 of them in Gray County that was out of Wheeler County. That goes back to our Sweetwater Creek mutual aid agreements, something I did mention a while ago, of course. Uh, I think that came back to help Scott later on, but uh, we'd gotten Beckham County. This is actually in Oklahoma, so our Sweetwater Creek group actually covers counties in Oklahoma. We've got mutual aid agreements between eight counties in the Texas Panhandle and two, sometimes three counties in Oklahoma. So we had a, a Beckham County task force that came in uh, that also helped us, and then I had a, a, it was just a strike team that came from south into Collinsworth, so Wellington, Sam Norwood, and actually I had trucks out of Memphis, Texas as well uh, that was up part of that strike team, and so we, and those guys come to hell, I'm telling you. They had a brand new, uh, they had a brand new freight liner out of the steel, and they did put that board to work. I, they tested it. I, I witnessed it. They didn't mind using it. It's not a parade truck. Uh, they got right in after the program. And, uh, and I'll, something's been brought up to me here recently, but maybe something y'all can figure out. But my understanding is the feds, when they get their trucks, they come without that stuff on them. And my thoughts are, if it's good for the goose, it's good for the gander. So why can't we not get it that way? Yeah, that, that's what... That's well, the military trucks are so nice because they don't have it on there. They don't have them, but I'm hearing their one-ton pickups and all that are coming with that. So maybe, maybe we need to. Maybe when we, when Ken goes and talks to the National Guard, we can have them exempt of that, huh? Need something. And blades. I mean, like, well, Scott. You know, Scott a long time ago taught these guys how to run a blade on the fire, and those are gold. The blades are golden. Can you talk about a little bit about that, Scott? Well, I, I kind of started that, oh, it's been about 10 or 11 years ago. We had some blade operators. They would sink the toe of that motor grader in and cut out a notch in the ground this deep. And I, I just could never could understand. So I thought, well, maybe it's time we had a meeting, and we did. We got those folks in there, and I told them, I said, all I need is about two inches on your toe, about a quarter inch on a hill. Now, I know that's easy to sit there and tell somebody to do. But they pretty well got it because I said that ground will re re that ground will recover better from just cutting that much off versus this much because uh, there's still roots there that will come back. And I've had ranchers tell me ever since y'all started that my recovery has been better. Of course, there's still going to be a few weeds and stuff, but then that second motor grader he'll take that on into the into the black. You know, if you can get enough on fire line. And that's what I told them, and, and the recovery's been a lot better, and then you ain't got these mounds of dirt and grass that are this deep out there, you know, and it seems to be working. It, it, you know, it, and no, I probably it, need to revisit that because there's been some turnover in our county, too, over 20 years, you know. Yeah, so. it's, um, well, I, I'll testify to it. It works. And, and when Hemphill County, they come back and blade it back even. They, they come back and blade the windrows mm -hmm. back. Um, and I've had some ranchers tell me, he said, I don't care about that little windrow that, you know, just from doing what the flat blade didn't like they did. He said, I don't care if y'all come back, but as long as you ain't digging it this deep. Yeah. You know. But it's a, and it's a fast response time, too. You go, we call the blades, and the blades are there. I mean, they're, they're right behind the fire trucks. Yeah. That, and they're, they're, we don't have to load them on a the truck and get them out there. Mm-hmm. All right, I'll pass. Okay. Mr. Anders. One, I just want to tell you guys, thank you for what you do. Uh, there's nothing easy about what you do, and I've I've worked with our local volunteer fire departments, and I, I appreciate what you said about the Memphis Fire Department because we get some experience with those guys, and, and uh, they do do a nice job. But uh, I appreciate everything about the time that you give up, the time that you give up for your families. Uh, that That's all important to every one of us. Uh, what I would say is from this, this committee standpoint, is there anything 
we've talked about radios, we've talked issues of trucks and those kinds of things. And there's probably some of that we can do, and some of it's a little more difficult maybe than than others. But um, the biggest thing that that I have is ideally when you're fighting these kinds of fires, what does that command and control structure look like? What what would be most beneficial to you guys um, in trying to be able to coordinate those things and, and be able to fight those fires? Are you talking about from the state level or just in-house with us and when mutual aid? You know, when, when y'all were fighting these fires, you had people coming from all directions. So what we try to do, and let me kind of, maybe I can hit this for you, but I know here in Gray County and some of the guys that work with us out of other counties, when we get there, we, the incident commander automatically, whoever's area, say it's in mine, we're on our primary channel. And then at that point, we start breaking the flanks into V-fires and putting the command truck over there on each side. And he's running those sides on our V-fire 21 or 22, whatever. And then that way we take the command structure and break it down to where like myself if it was in our area i'm only talking to those commanders on that side and we're running two radios minimum in most trucks just for that reason you know bringing bringing like departments in where i've got a task force just like the, the beckham county group you know what helps me is assigning them to a particular area and I know they were just going to go take care of it and then they holler back whenever that job's done or they need more help or if they need a blade they call back same thing Scott's came to Whittler before I think it was the 09 fire and I just give him a particular area and he runs it so he's he's got a particular division he runs it uh, of course you've got to get off on different channels because everybody can't talk on one but just having the resources of like-minded firefighters and then assigning them an area and then they take care of it and let you know what else they need let me explain something for some of y'all that don't understand but v fire channels are line of sight and that works sometimes and sometimes it don't and it only works for so long so that's why I'd like to see us get some repeated channels, something that we can handle in these counties. Now, basically what they, they just explained to you is how me and uh, Philip and Robert, all of them work really well together. If I got somebody coming in, all like Robert's coming to Hemphill County, I'll sign him to the right flank or left flank and you know, I'll stay on a primary channel, but they just report back to me, but then they're in control, and we'll assign them, might be Fire 21 in the south side there on 22. That way we don't have all this bleed over on one another and talking over one another and try to keep the communication to a minimum, you know. And But we all pretty well operate the same way, and we kind of know how each other operate and have the same equipment and know what equipment can go where. It's like they'll, we'll call them up and tell them, we're going, you know, like Canadian, I kind of got to have rocky area to, on the north side of the river, we got the sandy area, you know, and I let them know, I'd like to, if you can, send me your five tons, something that can get around in that sandy area or the rocky area or, or whatever. So we work really well together. Done? Okay. Ms. Draper. <clears throat> so... Colorado has a statewide communication program where all the the Colorado pays for all the fi all the radios and all the communication and it's all ran statewide and then each fire department puts their own puts the radio in there and got their own freak. So would that be something if we went a statewide deal that would they provide radios or something like that? Would that definitely be something to look at i mean to get everybody on the same page because that like I say we do fairly well locally yeah right now it's just getting everybody either from uh the analog to the digitals uh well, i mean what well, sounds like what a crossroad right now yes we are fixing go analog or digital 
Yes, trying to get everybody onto the digital side is the big ticket right now. So now my, just, now my just a matter of funding. Yeah, my my yeah now might be the time to do it. But would y'all be on board for that or not? Would it be? I would think so. I've never been in operating in one of those systems, but if it's something that's useful, then we'd we'd be on board. No, it's all good. Members, other questions? All right. Well, I've got a few. Um, back on the radio, um, Robert, I believe you've said that you already got radios and, and they'll do digital and analog, correct? Yes, I can, I can talk back. Uh, like I say, we got them through Hawkins here in, in Pampa, okay. uh, the local radio shop. Because it's my understanding and um, from the, the Forest Service that, th because I, I'd, I'd heard a rumor that one of the reasons they couldn't talk is most of you guys were on analog and they were on digital. But it's my understanding that the state has the same radio that does both. So that also is a problem with communication because if they can talk but you can't get on the same channel, we got to figure that out. Whatever system we go to, and I agree, um, I agree with you, Trent, that you know getting everybody on the same page. The, I mean, two things that I've gleaned from today and in the investigation I've done so far. Number one, the federal government needs to stay out of our firefighting. And number two, we need to be able to talk to each other. And then number three, obviously, Scott, you have mentioned it, how much better it was in 17 when you had the same people with the Forest Service for a long time that you, you could talk to. And then all of a sudden we get in this big disaster and we've got new folks. And, and you know, um, I think... Obviously, that's something that just comes with territory. But we've got we've got to keep we've got to we've got to quit fighting old, the same old battles. You know, back in '06, and I think you guys would would agree with this. Um, it seems to me like every time we have new people, we have a turf war. And I think what um, uh, Mr. Henderson won't put words in his mouth, but I think one thing that he was asking. And I want to follow up on something you said, Robert, because um, not that everybody's testimony isn't great, but I love solutions. And you were very plain. When the Forest Service comes up here, I want them doing what I need them to do, basically is what you said. I want them mopping up. I want them getting to where I can't get to. I don't want them coming in and taking over my fire. Is that, is that a fair assessment of your testimony? Yes, that is exactly correct. Well, that's the kind of intel we need. If we're going to rewrite and help this communication process, this committee not only needs to hear that, the Texas Forestry Service needs to hear it because those guys, I don't know one of them that, that are intentional on letting stuff burn down, but when they show up, it's like, oh, Calvary's here, we're the, we're the boss now, but you guys are out there doing the work and it, something's got to give there. So I like the fact that you just came out and said, this is what I want them to do when they show up on my fire. I think that's that's one of the most helpful things, and I I see all of y'all nodding. I think that's you all feel that way. Is that correct? So yes, sir. I really I really like that um, as as a good starting spot when we start uh, when you know if we rewrite the rules for the 2604, and certainly you need more funding, right? Um, we we've hammered on on Tithmas a lot. And, and I get it, but I want to be with it real clear again. We're hammering on the program and how the money's spent, not your fellow firefighters, because those guys do what you do. And if if they, I would imagine most of them, if you said come get in my truck, they go with you. They know what to do. So I'm not. I, I don't want us to. I don't want to get caught up with the personnel of Tiff of Tiffmas because they serve a role too. And 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 I get it. You see. See them coming up here, you see them, all this money they're spending, and you go, um, man, if I had those dollars, look what I could do. Perfect, perfect response. Except in the Texas legislature, you're never going to get your funding by tearing somebody else's down. I can promise you that. that so Texas has plenty of resources. So I want us to kind of move away. I, listen, I, I want this committee and this report to delve into what's wrong with TIFMAS. What's wrong with 2604? What's wrong with communication between our locals and the Forest Service? But I don't want us to get bogged down in taking a resource away to fund another because you'll never be successful in the legislative process that way. 
So, you know, I'm just pointing it out for reference. We can do this without tearing templates down, without defunding the Forest Service. We can do it. Um, we just have a, to have a different point of attack. Um, One more thing real quick. Yes, sir. The Tiffmas sure. deal, here's a communication breakdown. Uh, we're day six, day seven in, and I'm getting phone calls of, hey, we need you to get a strike team together to go help a neighboring county. Why do you need a strike team out of my guys that have, are day six, seven in this deal when I have a whole town full of these trucks? Why are they not headed that way? That's right. That fresh guys. To me, it's not nothing to do with Tiffmas, but it's a communication. It's a communication break it down breakdown, somewhere. and it's somebody calling the shots that's not on scene. That's, a, that's exactly. What it, that's what it has appeared to me is shots are getting called, people are quarterbacking from the armchair, and they're not out there actually doing it, and that's always a problem in a crisis. So I, I think these are all things this committee can put in our report and certainly work toward um, getting through with it. Uh, these EPA regs on your diesel trucks. So basically what you're telling this committee, if you're going to buy a one ton or a military truck or anything, you got, you're got you looking for something prior to the year 2000 when the California regs went into the federal government code. That's the best time, yes, sir. Because if you get anything past the 2000, you're into death or even worse, the electronic emissions control, which your trucks had never run with that stupid thing. So... We, if when you're, but that doesn't help you out when you're talking about F 350s. You know, you're not going to go get a 1998 F 350. Nope. So you have to deal with it. So we got to deal with it. So we need to figure out while we're talking about relaxing rules and regulations and those kind of things, um, I don't know how, how we get there. But I do think our federal partners and our Congress needs to address that for emergency management. No doubt. You know, I get it. They, you know, we're all going to drive fancy golf carts from now on, but you're not going to fight fires in a Tesla. So, mm -hmm. and, and <laughs> so I'm not sure where that needs to go um, to get out of that, but I know as somebody who owns trucks and has bought a lot of trucks and deals with the federal regulations of it, I know exactly what you're talking about. You know, um, I've got a 2019 F-350, and if I let it idle 10 minutes, it starts making this funky sound, and and it and then starts choking up and dies, and that's not that's not functional. What you're telling me, that's not functional for what you're doing. If you even had the money to buy the truck, so what we do is go to the gas version, which, which is, is dangerous. underpowered. We might as well buy the Tesla. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean. In reality, they don't have the power that the diesel motor deals. That's right. That we need. And even our fire engines, you go plumb to the engines. The one we put in service a while back, two years ago now, it's got a death filter. It's got all the stuff. And the number one thing they tell you is do not let them idle, and you've got to get them up to highway speeds and let them do their thing. These trucks don't do that very often. Well, I think... Uh I think, I think that is something this committee, obviously this panel can't answer the question, I can't answer the question, but I think this panel or this committee needs to investigate options for fire trucks out there and, and see what's available going forward because worse than not giving you the money in new trucks is giving you a truck that won't run. That, that's, pretty, that's, pretty, that's disturbing to me. As somebody that, you know, frankly wants you to come put the fire out if it's at my house. Um, we, we, that needs to be addressed, um, whether, whether it's with uh, the automakers themselves or, or Congress. Or, and, and certainly we're going to look and see what the state might be able to do to address that. But that's not only stupid, it's dangerous. So... Um, Next thing I w wanted to uh, ask about, Scott, you know, um, me and you were on a mission to put new shoes on all the trucks we could find, and we found a bunch of tires. And then we, we, got, we had some help coming. Did that help fall through? Have you been able to get tires now? I haven't heard anything in three weeks, other than I give some folks some tire sizes. You know, we were supposed to get some tires at cost. 
and then they were going to uh, I give two or three people tire sizes that we're looking to go to okay. and some tires that need to be replaced but I hadn't heard anything in quite a little bit well I can we, I can tell you um, I should have followed up on it too when I didn't hear back from you I thought our tire crisis was over for the time being um, I will put that on my list to circle back and find out why you hadn't got that phone call Okay, and and you know the thing of it is, I want everybody to hear this. When Scott, when these guys are running a a, a military style truck from 1969, how many of you have ever heard of a tire size 916? Unless you're from 1969, you've never heard of that, and that's what I was hunting. For the, for the Lipscomb Fire Department was 916 tires. That's part of the problem is we've let these trucks get so old that the manufacturers don't make replacement parts for them. And, and that's the critical part of, of what I want to get to when we're talking about resources is getting upgraded trucks where you could actually buy tires that fit them. I mean, it's not that you can't find the tire you want. They don't make them. So... I, I can't, I think that is something that is not having upgraded equipment and newer model equipment is going to continue to be more and more detrimental because the, manuf the original manufacturers don't support those sizes anymore. So having newer equipment is, is the only answer because they're never going to go back to making a 916 tire. Um, last question for all of you. When you're talking about radios and communication, um, you you heard earlier we had uh, we had testimony from AT and T was here talking about the first net contract contract, and it sounds like they have the contract on all of your counties. How was your cell service out in the middle of those fires? Uh, Mine actually worked pretty good. <laughs> good. I do I do have first net. I was around Canadian. I lost service. Whenever we dropped right down in the bottom, uh, in the edge of town. You were probably by side. my house. Yeah, I don't know. But right down in the bottom off of Elsie Street, mm -hmm. straight east. Mm -hmm. uh, whenever we was down in there, I had the SOS. But everywhere else, it worked fairly good. You get over close to Allison, of course, up 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. And back, there's some thin spots over around Allison. But everywhere else, my first net actually worked very well. Okay. I actually switch from somebody besides AT&T back to AT&T the other day and yeah I had actually great service so okay good I have no complaints uh, good service in spots if you don't know Roberts County uh, you're gonna lose service no matter who you got and the rough stuff so fair enough I, I have pretty fairly good service you know like you said depending on where you're at on Charlie Brown Road or you go on out Marshall Drive, there's kind of a dead spot in the curves out there. But I I know my wife gets mad because I got service and she doesn't because I got on first net. Mm. So I hear that quite a bit. But anyway, <laughs> but I mean, you, like you say, if you go over to Higgins, it's almost non-existent. Right. But there's this feud between OU Cellular and AT&T, and somehow they got where they had to turn the tire away mm -hmm. from yeah. that area. Oh, I remember that. Because of a feud, you know. I haven't heard about it lately because I no longer represent Lipscomb County, but I used to hear a lot about it. Yes, sir. So, um, okay. Yeah, we, we well, that, that, you know, that's that's good intel. And um, one of the panels uh, coming up tomorrow, we're gonna we've got more uh, technical uh, experts to talk about radios and and communication and and all of those kind of things because I don't have I don't think we have the answer on what radio solves all the problem, but I'm hoping that it's one thing that we can make a recommendation to the legislature on is this is the system the state needs to be on for emergency man or emergency management or emergency first responders or whatever we call it. So that was, that was kind of it for me. Members, you got any other questions for these guys? All right, gentlemen, thank you for being here. Wait a second. So I'm going to return. Um, 
we'll have a little redirect. The chair calls uh, Chief Nim Kidd and Chief West Moorhead. Chief, for the record, um, please just state your name and who, who you represent. Yes, sir, Nim Kidd, Chief of the Texas Division of Emergency Management, Chair of the Emergency Management Council. West Moorhead, Fire Chief, Texas A&M Forest Service. Thanks, guys, for coming back up. I appreciate it. I've just got two, um, uh, two questions. First one uh, really is is for you, Chief Kidd, because you you're the one that explained containment numbers to me, and I and you know my reaction was the same as the witness on the previous panel. Um, to me, when it's out, it's out. But just for clarification and for the record, can you please explain to this committee um, what containment means in your world and why when the fire's out we're not calling it contained? I can, and I would also like to share that with Chief Moorhead because the majority of those decisions come out of a different program. Okay, well, but, would you? But if it's okay, I'd like to start with that if that's all right with please. you. Please. I want to start by saying the TIFMAS program, nor any of the TIFMAS firefighters, they do not report or decide containment numbers. And any accusation made towards them that they are milking this or dragging this out for any gain is irresponsible and it is not true and it is inflammatory. So I hope that never happens again. Now, those containment numbers, from my perspective, also are a message to the community about fire protection. We have talked a lot about power lines causing wildfires. Nationwide, statistically, humans are the cause of more wildfires than any other source. Mm -hmm. That message to the community has to do with this fire is not contained, and when we were here in the Panhandle briefing, that was part of our message. A lot of resources are here. We do not need any new starts. When conditions changed during those fires, we got into weather pattern changes, and a fire, uh, an ember that blows outside of the containment line that starts a new fire is devastating to the response. Mm -hmm. It is not as clear and scientific as you and I would like to 550 miles of perimeter, which is what this fire was, and dividing that by the number of black or cold line to get your containment. Mm -hmm. So I think it is somewhat leading and can be considered misleading when we report out the number of containment, but it is also designed to make sure that we have a good, strong, firm protection around that because the last thing any of us want to do is to have to go back to a judge and ask to issue another evacuation order in an area that we said was already contained. I understand. So if, as I recall in our conversation when I asked you the question, about what containment means. Didn't you tell me you have rules in place that somebody has to physically drive every mile of the black before and, and make sure there's not smoldering on a hot spot? I mean, you, you, you or the Forest Service physically lay your eyes on the entire burn before you'll call it 100% or extinguished, yes, right? Sir. That was the differentiation yes, between containment and extinguishment. Yes, sir. Is that correct? Yes, sir. So being a million acre fire, it certainly took some days to, yes, to make that circle. Am I, is that a fair statement? It is accurate, yes sir. Okay, I just think it's important that sometimes uh, besides rumor mill, we get lost in jargon that we hear on the news or somebody read on Facebook or whatever. And I, I don't want to mislead people when I say containment when I'm in extinguish. And I knew you and I had, had that conversation, so thank you for explaining that again. Chief Moorhead, do you have something to add to that? Yeah, just, just briefly to add to that, the instant commander on scene will make the call on what containment is. And what they're looking at is the amount of line that they are sure that that fire is not going to escape from. So as you see a slow progression of containment, on this fire in particular, it's simply because there are over 500 miles of perimeter line. And so crews were evaluating, to Chief Kidd's point, evaluating uh, every square, f every, every linear foot, if not on the ground by air, to make sure there was no smoldering embers, nothing else that would uh, 
come outside that line. They felt solid about when we say 20% line, that's 20% of that 500 miles of line. They felt solid. It would not escape from. Okay. All right. Well, that, that answers for me that, that clears, clears that up. Um, so this, this question may, I, either one of you are welcome to answer it. And I don't know if you have any, any intel you can share with us, but the EPA regulations on DEF and diesels and how diesel vehicles run today, that's a real problem. And it's not just for these guys. It's got to be a major issue for your departments as well. What are you doing about it? And how, how are you handling this? Because we don't have any choice, particularly when it comes to one tons and that kind of stuff, to, but to buy new. You know, you can buy the old military trucks for a while yet that are prior to California regulations. Um, or the California emissions rules, but you, I mean, there has to be a plan somewhere. So you got anything you can share with this committee that our local fire departments might glean on, on where to purchase vehicles? I'll share our experience. We are confronted with the same issue. So all of our equipment is deaf at this point. All of our dozers are. We have worked with Caterpillar for a fire package fire response package, and we do have an override currently on those dozers. That's not available on other models, but we worked with them to establish that so that we don't have a fire dozer going to limp mode and put an operator at risk. Now, we don't have that same platform on our engines and our haul trucks. We are attempting to get that. We've hit resistance for that, um, but to the gentleman's point earlier, that is definitely an issue. We wouldn't want our track, our dozer to go into limp mode. We don't want our fire engines going into limp mode. Right. We struggle with that. And another thing that we struggle with is that we don't run the highway miles uh, that a normal sure. deaf engine would. And so we constantly have problems servicing that deaf system. I don't have a silver bullet for it. For it. Just wanted to let you know that we are experiencing the same issues. And you are currently, um, I'm assuming, working with manufacturers other than Caterpillar, because obviously they don't make pickup trucks. Um, to to hopefully find a solution for emergency management? We are. We have uh, an order in, just for instance, for Kenworth, Kenworth haul trucks for our equipment. Um, we just denied that order because they would not take the def off of that and wouldn't do an override for us. And, uh, and trucks are extremely hard to get. We hated to make that decision, but we felt it put our people at risk. So when they weren't willing to honor a def override, we canceled the order. So to get away from this, um, having to have a deaf override, is this a is this a, a federal problem that the state the state can't actually override that because of the federal mission standards? Is that correct? That's my understanding. Yes, sir. So we would have to um, get something out of Congress to to combat this. It and Chairman, it's not just during firefighting. We see the th same thing in water rescue with our boats. Okay. I have to go to two cycle versus four cycle. I can't use two cycle anymore, which was the best motor that was out there for water rescue. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the same challenges when the EPA puts these restrictions on us that every other commercial manufacturer does. And we so, need to make a change, but it's so going to be at the federal level. Do you agree with the last panel, though, that um, going to a gas truck is actually dangerous in these firefighting situations? So in our experience, uh, gas, particularly in uh, haul trucks, we just don't have the power to move the equipment. Uh, as far as uh, engines and stuff, we do have a mix of both. Uh, we do see longevity in the engines when we go with diesel, uh, barring def, that is definitely an is issue. But um, we are trying to go more toward a diesel just for longevity in our engines. But gasoline, you don't have to deal with death, and there are some pros to that. Okay. Wow. Good. Chairman, if, if, if I may, there was some other uh, Tithmas statements that I'd, I'd like to be sure that we, for the record, we get correct. Go for and, it. You're and, here. And one is the far majority of the apparatus in the Tithmas program are bought and paid for by local taxpayers that are allowing us to borrow their resources. They're not state-owned. Matter of fact, Chief Moorhead and I were talking. With the legislature funds for volunteer fire departments is about 20 to 21 million dollars a year. For the paid departments that are in the TIFMAS program, it's about two million dollars a year. So the far majority of those beautiful fire trucks that I've heard a lot of complaints about being up here 
They're paid for by the local tax dollars of those local communities taxing their citizens. Mm -hmm. They're not paid for by the citizens of this part of the state. Mm -hmm. So if we want a different type of fire apparatus in this part of the state, we should have local conversations about that. Mm -hmm. I, I'm also hearing we rely heavily on our volunteer firefighters up here. And, and I'm grateful for them. I'm grateful for the men and women that do that. Some of those departments have, I don't know, up to 20 members that have full-time jobs, and they should never be penalized for going to a volunteer fire call. But in our paid departments, at any given time, two-thirds of that workforce is off-duty and available for recall. That's why we borrow them from those other jurisdictions to And I really don't think that's what we mean right now. I really don't. That's because, certainly not what I mean. Because but for the request to those other fire chiefs and those other fire departments, those are not state employees. Those are local government employees that that local government is choosing to allow to come up here, that we're paying the bill for them and their backfield, that's a true statement, to be here to support our local partners that are here. But, but you also heard testimony that was a little bit in conflict. I heard one member say, we should have our own TIPMAS program up here. And I heard another member say, you shouldn't ask us for TIPMAS members, you should get them from outside. And I think that deserves some more exploring. Either we're going to build an organization here in the Panhandle in the 26 counties that supports the Panhandle, of which today, under current state law, there is nothing that prohibits them from doing that. Nothing. State law today, the legislature changes, statewide mutual aid allows fire chief to help fire chief here today with no additional resources. And maybe we need to explore that again. Understood. Understood. Well, I can tell you, I, and, and I think I've been extremely clear today from this dice. Um, I brought this committee to Pampa to the Panhandle because this is where the fires were. You know, we're um, not professional. Uh, all of us used to the committee process. A lot of our witnesses, they're not used to testifying. And um, we're, we've learned some lessons today that comments, um, unfounded comments maybe, or, or maybe undereducated comments, certainly have consequences. But nobody on this committee. Um, has, has meant any of those things malicious. But as you can tell, part of the reason, um, Chief Kidd, I'm one of the committee here, not in Austin, is the level of frustration in this room. I frankly think um, this, this committee, our panelists, and our audience members have behaved extremely well. Uh, and I'm, I'm very proud of of those in attendance and the co and the comments that were made, I get it. Some of them are misleading, um, and some of them, some things we've heard. You've heard me ask witnesses about rumors I heard too. Um, I don't think it's as much the questions that got asked or the comments that were made. Maybe it was ha maybe it was the delivery. Um, my wife's told me our entire married life. It's not what I said; it's how I said it, and I'm a firm believer in that. So. I don't want anyone around the state to think we're not grateful for the assistance we got, but I was here during it. Uh, you know, I, I was in the middle of it myself. My property burned down. I had, I had TIFMAS um, volunteers come out a week after the fire and want to drive through the ranch to see if I had a hot spot. They didn't have a lot to do. Now, I let them. They came out, um, we saw, met them at the cattle guard. They said, can we drive, drive around your hot spots? I said, yes, you can, just don't dig any more ditches. That's, you know, it's fine. Um, but a lot of landowners have had other experiences than what I had. And, and the, the, I don't think anybody has meant to offend, but you can't take a bunch of people who just watched 75% of their county burn down 
and um, they couldn't talk to each other and expect a hundred percent understanding on every issue that's what this is about I'm hoping to educate our community I'm hoping to fix communication problems with our Forest Service and and I'm hoping to fund our volunteer fire departments when this is over so if we've offended anybody chief around the state you can apologize on my behalf but my community is hurting right now and I'm gonna give them a little grace <laughs> Thanks. Um, next, anybody? Questions for these guys? Thank you for coming back. We've got one more panel, so don't run off. We may be back. Do what? Call them up. You'll be back. Okay. Um, all right. Chair calls uh, Jacob Clifton. Archie Stone. And Alan Wells. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and just read you guys in like I have everybody else so we can um, carry on the conversation. I've got Jacob Clifton, Fire Chief, Skellytown Fire Department. Is that correct? Yes, sir. I've got Archie Stone, Wildland Coordinator, Border, Fire, Texas, Border, Border Fire Department. Border, do I have your permission to add Border Fire Department to this? Yes, sir. And I've got Alan Wells, Fire Chief, Stanat Volunteer Fire Department. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Do any of you gentlemen have an opening statement, or do you wish want us to start hammering you with questions? I do have a small opening statement, if that's okay. Please go ahead. So I'm uh, Jacob Clifton, Fire Chief, Skellytown Fire Department. Um, I'm a career paramedic and run an ambulance service. That's what I do for a living. I've been a volunteer firefighter for about 10 years now and a fire chief for seven of those. Uh, I've been on numerous incidents um, and I would like to address some of the things that have been said earlier today. Our uh, local TFS folks are phenomenal. I think they all deserve a pay raise. I don't think they get paid enough and I don't think there is enough of them. Um, Ashley Johnson, our regional coordinator, is probably the best person in the world, um, in my opinion. One of the points that I would like to address with that is uh, she actually sends emails to all of us fire chiefs on a, on a regular basis anytime there's a red flag warning. But this is the amount of resources that are available locally. This is the aircrafts that are available locally, if there are aircrafts available. Um, and that's sent out almost every time like clockwork, and I think myself and um, other fire managers, chiefs, uh, can attest to that. So I think there's a, a misconnection of what's available and who knows that. Um, I think it's also important to remember that this is not uncommon to the panhandle. We deal with large wildfires on a regular basis. Uh, my community has almost burned down four or five times since I've been the fire chief. We are very used to, unfortunately, this setting. Um, I think it's also important to remember that we're also used to not getting aircrafts. Uh, we're used to the wind being too high that they can't fly. Um, the other thing I would like to address is there's an, a large difference between a certified firefighter and a trained firefighter. The certification process takes a lot of work, a lot of time, and I can't mandate that for my personnel um, to get that to meet those objectives. I can mandate that they're trained and know how to do the job the right way um, in a safe manner. And I think that's an important thing to remember throughout that. On the radio stuff that's been talked about and discussed today in depth, uh, other states have statewide radio systems, state-owned, state-funded. It happens. In the Texas Panhandle, we have a 
radio system that is managed uh, through the PRPC called the PANCOM system. Uh, it's old, it's antedated, and it doesn't work half the time. <laughs> um, most of us fire chiefs in this area uh, have purchased our own repeaters so that we can fix those problems because we were tired of being told that there's no money to fix it. Uh, my organization had to do that ourselves. Um, there's lots of things that uh, can be addressed with that. I would also like to push the, uh, as, as legislatures, that we fix the problem with volunteers being protected with their jobs. Um, I had one member of my organization that was um, not terminated, but did have some consequences for choosing to leave his paid job to come protect our community. I had about 15 other members that were told they couldn't leave because they had to work, and they didn't because they didn't want to get fired, because they have to have a job. They have to pay the bills. Um, the other thing I would like to say is I would like to give a shout out to the TIFMAS program. Um, I understand there's some challenges, there's some bad eggs, and there's some good eggs. Uh, we had a strike team, I believe it was strike team 101 uh, from the TIFMAS program uh, that gave my guys a break when we fought fire for almost 48 hours straight. It wasn't as long of a break as I would have appreciated, but it was something. Uh, we got a four hour nap uh, at our own homes and our own beds, and that was great. Um, those guys worked their tails off for our organization for our community uh, and in our area. Uh, and that's all I have for that. Yeah, so I'm Archie Stone. Uh, I am the wildland coordinator for Border. I'm also a volunteer firefighter there in Fritch, Texas. And then I'm also a prescribed burn manager with the state of Texas. And uh, I'm also with the National Park Service on a call when needed basis, and I'm qualified ICT4 and a task force leader. And I am very proudly to say I'm part of TIFMAS. Very proud to say that. And I appreciate your words earlier. This shouldn't be a bad session. I've been part of this program for since about 18. Yes, there are problems. There are issues. It's a new newer program we're working on trying to get these people trained up and everything else to where they need to be but it's it's growing pains and yes they're coming to different parts of the state that they aren't normally fighting fire in but we're working on that we've got some nice wildfire academies we've got one up here in the panhandle right now that i'm on the board of and i have people from all over the state come up here and learn from us burn with us so you know, like you said, everybody's growing pains for this committee, but yes, I'm not going to lie, my toes were stepped on. And then uh, also, you know, uh, I know tomorrow's more of the mitigation stuff, but, you know, I am the wildland coordinator for Border. I'm the one who goes around our town, I identify problem areas, weaknesses where I know fire is going to be a problem, and, you know, me, along with my city management, my fire department, we did that prescribed burn at seven miles long on the southwest side of town. And we, it, we protected many homes. And with as fast as that fire was moving and the way it came across from Fritch, you know, we, we might have even saved some lives. But definitely a ton of homes and livelihoods. You know, so if anything, tomorrow I really hope y'all will ask the questions. We need to get some money out there to help with these prescribed fires. We need to educate people to, so that they understand, yes, it is fire, there is a risk, but believe me, I'd not rather have a you know, fire get away from me in somewhat of a controlled environment. You know, it is fire, it's prescribed, but uh, you know, then lose a whole neighborhood. So, you know, Really, I, I'm, uh, yes. Nope. Are you, are you finished with your statement? We're gonna come back to you, do you? Well, and one other thing. So I, I wanna go along with Jacob. Uh, I, I've heard the issues as far as TFS goes myself, incident commanding that day. I was in touch with our TFS people quite regularly through phone calls, text. Um, they were letting me where they were at. They were as busy as we were. They were engaged. Um, I didn't have problems with communications. You know, I've got, we have both the seven and 800 trunk systems in our trucks, but I also have a VHF radio also. 
So I was able to, you know, and that's what most of the TFS folks run on. You know, me and Jacob, we mutual aid with each other all the time there in Skellytown. I just swap over to one of our V channels and me and him usually don't have much of an issue. Okay. Um, so, you know, I, communications is an issue. You know, I can't really talk as far as the rest of what I've heard today. But uh, like I said, uh, a lot of the problems I heard, I didn't see that day. And believe me, we were running and gunning and doing our best just like everybody else was. It was a heck of a day. Okay. Well, Mr. Stone, nobody wants you to testify about anything you didn't see. So your, your perspective is just as valuable as those that came before you. I just want you to know that. So we're going to, we'll come back to you. Um, Mr. Wells, did you have something you wanted to start with? Yes, I do. <clears throat> Malcolm Wells, I'm the fire chief for the city of Stinnett volunteer fire department. Also the emergency management coordinator for the city of Stinnett. I've been the chief since September of 2006, right after the East Admirella complex. Um, I was a paramedic for 17 years, a uh, volunteer. I volunteered my entire adult life. Still a volunteer. My hope is to retire at the end of this year from my paying job that I've been at for, at that time, will be 35 and a half years. The North County Road O fire, which started on February the 26th at approximately 12.56 p.m., started north of Stinnett. I had one truck available, a Type 6, that responded <clears throat> along with Stinnett EMS, along with law enforcement, not just from Stinnett, but also Hutchinson County and the city of Border. There were houses impacted that were in the line of that fire. The fire itself was not our concern at the time. It was life safety. As my fire truck pulled up over the hill, North of Stinnett, the road was covered with black smoke. My wife is also on the volunteer fire department and she was staffing that truck. Her voice that day on the radio was scared. She was not involved in the 2006 fires. She has been involved in the 2011 and 2017 fires that have affected Hutchinson County. Their main plan was to get personnel evacuated. The other thing was not to get anybody killed with truckers and people driving through the smoke. At one point, a semi had to be stopped as they came out of the smoke because their tires were on fire. If they had not have stopped that vehicle, the entire town of Stinnett would have been in flames. When I got on scene approximately 10 minutes later from leaving my paying job, there was nothing I could do on that part of it. However, I did know that I had a rancher that was in the direct line of it. I immediately went past and went towards the head of the fire to figure out was it going to him. I worked my way all the way back to him. I watched the fire pass his house. Mind you, I do not have water on my command vehicle. I was waiting for structure protection to come back there to his residence. And there's another ranch houses just to the north of him. When they got there, the fire was actually, had, the head had already gone by whenever they got there. 
Shortly thereafter, a maintainer from the Turkey Track Ranch came up and was able to get there and start putting in some blade line to put in fire break around the house. Luckily, the house was defendable. Beyond that point, then I moved command back to the Stinnett baseball fields. I woke up at 4 o'clock on Monday morning, February the 26th. I was up from Monday morning, 4 a.m. on February the 26th until 10 p.m. on February the 27th after I had 21 houses burned on the south side of Stinnett. <clears throat> I need to say thank you to Border Fire Department, Fritch Fire Department, Dewis Fire Department, Dalhart Fire Department, Potter County Fire Department, our Hutchinson County Road and Bridge personnel, our Hutchinson County Emergency Management personnel, and finally, Texas Forest Service when they were able to finally arrive on scene. Maintainers, I had four maintainers working that fire. Three dozers were inbound to me. One of the trucks broke down and ended, ended up with two dozers. I stayed up that first night waiting for a response from the dozers to let me know what they needed, anything. Personnel on my trucks, I had two trucks that remained out until 3 a.m. The rest of them I sent home to get some rest. Tuesday morning, the trucks went. One truck went with three Tiffany strike teams, and I believe that was strike team 102, 106, and 118. Turkey Track Ranch has many camps out there. And those engines, those strike team of engines actually went out there to actually verify that we didn't have any issues out in that area. The border complex sent me personnel as well as Spearman and Groover. First thing I had them do was check the south fire line. Why? Because I knew there was going to be a wind shift later that afternoon that if we didn't have a cold line on the south side the fire could burn right back into the city of Stinnett. They checked the fire line. My one truck that went with the strike teams called me and told me we had issues at headquarters. The strike teams attempted to perform a burnout operation. However, about the same time they started the burnout operation, the west side of the fire crossed the county road and headed towards headquarters. The strike teams went in and protected that headquarters building and things around that. However, at approximately 113, I believe it was, 126 maybe, there were too many fires going on at that time because I had trucks left in town that ended up responding to another fire on the Canadian River. Both of those trucks, along with Crutch Ranch and the units that I could not utilize up there on the north side of this fire, were sent to the Canadian River area. After they went on that fire, it wasn't but 10, 15 minutes later when the 687 Reamer fire popped off. And I responded from County Road F to 687 and Reamer Road. That is when about the time I pulled up is about the time that the fire crossed Farm to Market 687. I immediately began calling for somebody to tell me where the smoke was heading because I could not tell you was it going to go south of town or was it going to run right into Scott's Acres. 
I had personnel tell me the smoke is going just to the south of Scott's Acres, but it is shifting and heading towards Scott's Acres. At that time, I called for an evacuation of Scott's Acres. I can't tell you the time. I know it's documented in our emergency management paperwork as to what time the, it crossed the road and what time the notification was made. One fire truck was what I had when that fire started. That one fire truck was one responder that had actually gotten off work because of the winds that day, had come to town and had picked up the truck and immediately responded to the ranch house on 687 that the fire was burning up to. He was there by himself and protected that ranch house with the rancher and it did not burn. His barn did, but his house did not. That happened after I left and went back to Highway 136. And by the time I got back over to 136, I saw the first houses burning. That time I had to turn over command. I could not do it. The amount of time that I had been up, I did not feel that I can make good decisions for the firefighters or the personnel of the community. Over the next two weeks, three weeks, I don't remember, it all runs together. I did throw some fits. I did have some issues with the Texas Forest Service. I was not being communicated with. <clears throat> Finally, I was able to communicate with them and told them, look, if you have people in my area, I want to know who's in my area and I want to know where they're at. I want to know what they're doing. Because if something happens to one of them, they're my responsibility. That's my area. From that point on, I never had an issue. I had phone calls. They came by and met with me. They told me where they were at. They showed me the line that had been checked. They verified this is the area that is good. We're moving to this area. I knew what was going on within the area. The EMS personnel, wonderful. And the Tiffmas crews that actually did come in and took over my station after the loss of Fire Chief Seb Smith, they took my station over for the next five days because I did not allow any of my personnel to carry a radio home with them to respond, except for my officers, to be able to show them where the call would be. TIFMAS took care of that for my city. Originally, they sent me four engines. However, I told them all I need is one. I have one engine in my city, one structure engine. They gave me a structure engine and they gave me two type sixes to remain there with me, as well as Smyre Volunteer Fire Department and Northeast Midland County Fire Department. Rawls came to help as well. Mr. Wells, um, can, I, can I ask um, where was that Tiffmas crew out of that you turned your station over to? Do you remember what city they came from? Fort Worth. It's a hodgepodge. Of it, it's a mixture, but I, I know that Cody Stillwell was one of the strike king leaders that was at my station. They actually split them up into two 12-hour shifts. Okay. Well, I, just just out of curiosity, I was just wondering, because I, I saw them from all over the state, and so I, I was, obviously wasn't over in Hutchinson County during all, all of this, so I was just curious what part of the state they, they came from. I know particularly, I remember Cody being there for that. But Cody was also, I believe he was strike team 102, Bear County strike team 106. Those were the two task forces that came in, checked in with me on a daily basis and verified where they were gonna be for that day. Good, 
Well, and and I I'll tell you, you know, we've heard we've heard some uh, uh, stuff about the Forest Service. We've heard stuff about TIFMAS. We've heard about breakdown in communication and that kind of thing. And that, you know, I, I I certainly think it's healthy to hear another perspective. And and I'm actually kind of glad we're going to end with this panel today because um, you have a different perspective than some of the testimony we've heard before you. So that. I think I think that's that's totally helpful. I don't want to get into more of the questions. Um, well, first of all, thank you for fighting fire. You know, we 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 owe everybody who was willing to do that a debt of gratitude. And it, a million acre fire is a whole bunch, but it could have been so much worse without the people on the ground and and the resources from that we we had coming in from all over the state. So. I appreciate that, but you listened to the to the testimony of the of the previous fire chiefs, and outside of your uh, uh, disagreement with the value of TIFMAS, um, I think we've we've hit that we beat that horse enough right now. Do you is there anything that you know we've talked about needing to redo the twenty six oh four grant? We've talked about better communication all day long. We've talked about the radio issue and having a, a statewide radio program what can you tell us that your departments need um beyond and you know we can we can revisit some of the same topics i'm not telling you not to mention them i'm just i just want to know from each of you if if we can fix the funding and the resource and, and the communication, what is the most helpful to keep your town from burning down again? So I would first like to say we have a lot of problems um, and money could fix most of them. Um, one thing that I think is important to remember as legislatures, as members of this committee, most of these volunteer fire departments in this area are not very well funded. I can speak to my organization. The only promised money that we receive on an annual basis is $25,000. Can any of you guys live today on $25,000 a year? How are we expected to do this? And I don't know the answer to those questions. I can tell you we've got three fundraisers going on right now. Uh, we're, we're bake sailed out. I don't know what else to do. This is a problem. I, there's got to be some sort of standard. Maybe that's at the county level. Maybe that's something that's done by the state to fund fire protection in this state. Um, we receive $25,000 from Carson County. We do not receive anything from our municipality. Um, you know, one of the things that, and I think I'm surprised I didn't hear earlier from the earlier panel, one of the jokes that's kind of went around our fire station this last couple months is, we hate big fires, we hate seeing the devastation, but it's about the only time we get funding. We have not gotten donations in this magnitude since I've been the fire chief. And I'm grateful for that. We're gonna do some capacity building and hopefully turn out better than what we did for the next one. But there has got to be a way to fix this on a stable, reliable basis. I'll be frank, my organization spends $17,000 a year on insurance to protect our firefighters to protect our equipment um, for our building. You can do the math, what that leaves us to operate on. If it wasn't for donations, if it wasn't for the grants, we could not operate. There's grants for equipment and we've been blessed. I can write a 10 page grant um, and tell my life story and get a grant. I can't get a 2604 grant. That's, we, I think that's been beat to death today as well. There's got to be a way to fix this. Um, so let me you know, ask you this. You, yes, you heard uh, Chief Tedwell's um, testimony earlier. Yes, sir. Um, it, you know, and um, he's certainly going to be in a position to be part of the legislative process going forward. Are you, um, did you, do you agree with what he said about funding and, and what we need to do going forward? You know, I don't know that I have all the answers to the questions. Um, there's got to be something. Well, that's I what we're here for. I don't know if it's a, a tax. You know, I think a great principle to look at is an ESD, um, and that's something that we are pursuing in our county. That takes a lot of work, um, money to set it up, um, and other processes. 
with that that we are exploring currently. I don't know if there's a way that the state can say, hey, here's $50,000 to every volunteer fire department. I, I don't know the answers to those questions, but I can't operate on less than $15,000. Yeah. I, uh, I can't buy PPE. Um, I'm not asking, and I am, I guess I shouldn't say that, but I'm asking for help with capital purchases, but I'm also struggling to pay the bills to, turn the light, to keep the lights on, put fuel in the trucks. I'll tell you a problem my organization experienced, and I'm not very proud to say this, our fuel cards got shut off during these fires. Our credit card for the organization got shut off because of fuel and buying parts. We had some money in the account, don't get me wrong, but I couldn't access it. How, how can we do this? Those are some real problems that need to be addressed. The Absolutely. grant needs to be worked through. There's other things that need to be worked through, but we've got to talk about funding. So, Jake, I'm going to stop you real quick. Um, Mr. Hunter has a question. So you said that your biggest cost was insurance. On an annual basis, that's the biggest promised um, chunk of my money, yes, sir. It's not the largest on the year, but it is the largest that I can count on every year. It's going to cost me $17,000. So you got a budget where you got to come up with seventeen grand just to operate. That's just to pay the insurance. That doesn't cover fuel, maintenance, PPE, training. And I'm sure those premiums won't go up now. <laughs> got to hope not. We'll do another bake sale to figure that Can out. You, <laughs> we may need to help you on the bacon. To the other chiefs here, because I should have asked all of you, but I'd like you to tell Chair King, do you have a high insurance premium that you're paying in Borger? That's going to be a city question. Uh, I wouldn't know what Borger's, as far as the insurance and stuff goes, uh, I don't know. How about yourself, sir? So I know that our workman's comp went up because last year I had a type three engine that rolled with two firefighters that were hurt uh, and I lost that type three engine. Uh, yes, it went up. I can't tell you how much, but the way our insurance works, it the, the initial amount that we get is humongous and then we get some kind of rebate during the year. I don't comprehend it. Well, you better not make a claim that rebate may be low. <laughs> That's true. So, but you've got an insurance issue. Yours is municipal. So I know that Chairman King has done a good job at requesting from somebody from the Department of Insurance, because this is an issue that we haven't really talked about today. And because Chairman Burroughs, you and Chairman King's constituents, you need to all think about that because I'll be having some questions uh, on the insurance issue because I, I hate to see you go through a catastrophe. You're already paying a lot. You, you all really are. Then what's going to happen to all the homeowners and businesses out here in West Texas? So that's something that will also be going into, but I appreciate you bringing that issue up because I'm very interested during this proceeding to see how you're impacted by the insurance situation. And uh, keep me posted on those bake sales. We may, we may be providing you some bake sale help. We appreciate Thank all you, support. Chairman. Members, questions? For the, this group? Um, Mr. Stone, I've got, um, I've got one, uh, one for you, but it sounds like you have lots of certifications and do, and do a lot of different jobs. So are you, are you a full-time firefighter in one capacity or another? So I do hold a federal red card as okay. far as wildland firefighting goes. Um, and, you know, the sort of my Texas burn license, you know, I took the classes, I conducted the burns. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the actual city of Borger actually carries the insurance for me to do that. Uh, it's 
because I do burn on private land, especially around the city of Borger. Um, and then, uh, so but I'm not a TCFP. I'm not going to be one of your certified structure firefighter guys. That's not that's not what I do. I've been strictly wildland since my fire career started. Since you brought this up, when you say the city of Borger for, um, provides your insurance, is that a is that an indemnity clause in case it gets away from you and does damage to? Well, I am. You know, since I am a commercial insured certified burner. Um, I was sued a few years ago and lost my insurance for my company. And some people looked at it and thought it was BS and they, the city of Border, wanted me to come and work for them and burn for them. So, okay. And the, and the reason I'm And it's required by the, you know, by the state. You have to have that right. to have the license. So, you know, um, on a little, little different scenario, a few years ago, my, um, my experience with controlled burns was Parks and Wildlife. Parks and Wildlife likes to burn state land. And um, I believe three times um, they lit the Gene Howe, and all three times it got away from them. Well, I lit the last one. Okay, you did the last one. But and that was 0.7 acres of an already hayed hay field. But here's the deal. And burners need to be protected in this state. We can't have people coming after burners to get off, get after a state entity. But here's here's what I'm going to ask you or tell you: When you worked for Parks and Wildlife, Parks and Wildlife was required to purchase insurance before they hired you to burn. Correct. And I know they were because I passed the law that made them do that. And they did, right? And they still have it. They do. So tomorrow, and I'm I'm just bringing it up a little bit today because we are going to talk about control burns a lot tomorrow. And this is a private property rights state. It is. And you're going to hear a lot of um, opposition to burning, and you're going to hear a lot of people that say they want it. Um, my, my thought is, if this, so the state took an active role on parks and wildlife because of state agency, but um, when cities or, or whoever, um, or pr private citizens hire you to go burn, do they automatically pay your insurance or, or because they're, my point is outside of, of parks and wildlife, the state law doesn't require a state agency to furnish insurance for a controlled burn because to my knowledge, parks and wildlife is the only one that does it for, as a state agency. Yes, to my understanding also. So when we talk about controlled burns, um, you know, uh, where, where this actually came from was the, the law or, or my bill. It came from the Gene Howe, mm -hmm. and when it got away, it burned down the Shannon Ranch. Well, it did about $3 million for damage to the ranch, and the Parks and Wildlife Foundation paid the landowner 40000 bucks because the state's sovereign. And, and I, I want to agree with you. I do believe, beyond a shadow of a doubt, if there is a gross, if, if there's a problem, it needs to be that that burn manner needs to be held accountable mm -hmm. and especially like you said three million dollars yes sir you better have your insurance and you better be ready but then on the flip side when a burn is good sometimes you do have your slops and spots i get it but all we need to have some kind of something in place i'm happy to pay for the grass for the hay just don't come hammer me and make me lose my insurance so when you I'm a perfectly good burner, I'm more than qualified to do this. I've burned all over the country. Right. So you lost your insurance um, through a civil case. It wasn't that you were convicted of, of any kind of negligence where you can't or prohibited from getting insurance, just your insurance said we're not gonna insure you anymore. Right. Well they were like, Hey, you just got sued. They ended up, you know, paying what they paid and then they said, Hey, guess what? We're out. And then I don't know how many of you are involved with the state as far as burn manager insurance and whatnot. It's hard to find. You can't find it. And then once you do have something like that happen, you're not going to get it. I mean, the last quote I got when I was looking for my company was over $80,000. And I can't pass that on to my customers. I, I, I was see. done. I see. So you, you continue to be as a burn manager, but whoever you work for furnishes your insurance. Now, or the insurance for the job you're doing. 
So most of the private burns that I do do are around border. So I've got some good partners around there. Like whenever I'm burning for the 4-6s ranch and stuff, they're giving up grass for me to put that seven-mile burn in, and we're giving up our time. So as far as we're not really getting paid, but I am a prescribed burn manager in case something does happen, then, of course, I'm going to be the one that they look at. I understand. Mr. Hunter. So you're a prescribed burn manager. Yes, sir. And you've had an incident where you lost your, well, basically, what you did was you had a claim, then they dropped you. Yep. And then you couldn't find it any other place. Correct. And then you need to be careful about who you buy from. All of you need to know because there's certain groups that are regulated in Texas, and there are certain groups that are not. So when you're doing it today, do you, is it like a private rancher, private business, private owner that you do it for? So, you know, I've, I'm in a unique situation being the wildland coordinator. We do do private burns with contracts in place. Um, it actually helps fund our wildland program. Um, but then also when I'm burning in town, I'm burning as the city of border. We had to actually change uh, some of our codes and stuff and tomorrow my city uh, emergency manager is actually going to talk about that He'll be able to explain to some of these cities that have questions about them burning in their own town Some of the things they need to do to make that happen if they're interested in May, it. May pass, him, pass it on. I'm going to have some questions Regarding the insurance, but basically you're covered by the city. Yes, sir uh, And I'll talk to you all about that. That's under a because he's under municipal government could have a different situation than you but I just want it clear that insurance which we're talking about at the end of the day another one of my subjects and you have private you're getting so expensive you can't afford it you have to watch what you do because they won't cover you anymore and so I don't want to see this developing. It seems to me one of the issue, both chairman and public members, is we may need to look at a way to access insurance because it's wrong that you're taking your lives to keep people alive and then all of a sudden you can't get insurance. How do you proceed next time? And so it sounds like to me we need a backup source so that you're not charged out of your whole livelihood. So, and, and I would like to say just a few more things. I don't want to get in and blow off all the steam for y'all tomorrow, because I'm sure y'all are going to be busy tomorrow. But uh, just a few things to think about. You know, there are some TFS grants out there that they do provide landowners, especially when you're performing, you know, fuel mitigation around your cities. The only problem is, you know, when I was doing that privately, the amount of money, it's like $30 per acre, but you're talking very small acres. You know, if, if you're looking at 100 acres, it's $3,000. That's not going to cover that burn manager's insurance, his, you know, people, the payroll, just to get it out there and get it done, the fuel. You know, it, it puts people in a bad spot. I would like to see for the state, TFS, you know, the grant program to kind of look at opening, upping that rate. And then the other caveat is for that grant program, you have to be a certified prescribed burn manager. You know, we don't have many. You know, if, if more towns look at Borger as a success, we performed that prescribed burn, we worked with a private entity, the Four Sixes Ranch, one of our best partners ever you know, allowing us to do what we do. And cattle is, a, is their thing out there on this part of the four sixes. And they give up a little bit of grass to help protect us, but then also they get a little bit of protection too. Because there is times we could have a start inside our, you know, our response area and it's gonna protect the fire from going on them. So, you know, it's kind of a give and take. But, but I'd like to see 
the grant things looked at, and then, you know, me, I am going to be more than happy. I'm going to, you know, I help out Stinnett, Fritch, as much as my city will allow, you know, to get that those towns locked in. Plus, I am a Fritch volunteer fireman. I know what needs to be done over there. You know, but we need help. You know, volunteers don't have the time. The guys have jobs. They don't have the money to do this type of stuff. So anything, any ideas that get thrown out, please listen to them. If y'all come with any ideas as a committee, it'd be great to help out, especially these volunteer departments that just don't have, don't have it. You understood what I'm saying? Thank you. Members for the questions of this committee. Mr. Abraham. So this is kind of a, on a different note. This is kind of for tomorrow. Set me up some, give me some questions for tomorrow. So in your county, you've got a bunch of little bitty oil field patches with little bitty power lines, and y'all send a lot of fires across the panhandle from those things. I'm not, it's not your fault. I'm just saying, y'all live with it, and y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. You got mom and Paul buys a pump jack, and they've got some little junky power line. Maybe it's, an, maybe it's an extension cord laying on the ground, running out there. What's the questions? What's the solution? I mean, I realize that this fire wasn't started that way. Maybe one of them was, but you guys do a great job fighting fire. How about we just not start the damn fire to start with? Right? We did it in no sit I mean, how many times have we done it? I'm, I'm, I'm running out of fingers. And they come from the same freaking spot every freaking time. Right? And it's normally not some big power company that can afford to buy 10,000 cows. Normally it's Ma and Pa, Oilfield 101. They buy it, and then they file Chapter 11 the next day, and then here we go. And we have a fire there, and we go, well, what? And we, we ask them, so why do you have a fire here? Well, I don't know. And you walk up to the breaker box, and there's a five-gallon bucket full of breakers. So for my question, it's for tomorrow. Give me some fuel for tomorrow. What's, what do I need to ask somebody, and who do I need to ask? I would like to know who regulates them. I don't know the answer to that question. Who regulates who? Who regulates the power lines? Oh. Who regulates the oil field infrastructure that's been left and that we get to deal with? Good question. Well, we have we will have the railroad commission here tomorrow to ask that or and, Thursday, Thursday to ask that question. And the and the public utility commission. Thank so you. All. Stay, so stay tuned because there's, there's going to be plenty to of questions asked. Yeah, I mean, I, I know we got the Railroad Commission. That's a freaking joke. You guys are on the ground. I bet Tiffany's is glad you're on somebody. Yeah. <laughs> Man, so I'm just saying that you guys drive over these, you guys drive over this stuff every day. Y'all know what I'm talking about. I'm sure if there was a, solu a good solution, y'all had already solved it. Certainly. All right. all right. Well, thanks. Thanks for thinking about it. And if you think of something, let me know. We'll be here all week. We're two, two shows a day. So, uh, members, is there further questions to this committee? No. Well, gentlemen, thank you for being here. I appreciate you sharing your testimony with us. Okay. Um, all right. Well, that concludes um, the testimony. Um, all the testimony we're going to we're going to hear today. We'll what, where is it? Read the script. I don't know where she put it. Yeah. Um, I just said that. Yeah. Uh, members, that concludes today's agenda. That's pretty much what I said. If, if there's if is there any further business before this um, committee to address tomorrow. Tomorrow. Not chair moves to adjourn. Is there objection? Hearing hearing none, this committee stands adjourned. Subject call of the chair. You know
Kent. This is the second investigatory committee I've been on the radio. Yeah. Huge issue.